Well, hello everyone. This is the Vantage Seminar. And I'm very happy today to have um, Tony Varelli Alvarado speaking. And he's gonna be talking about descent on K3 surfaces, Brower group computations and challenges. And uh, Tony, is it all right to video this talk? Yes. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys for the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, to be here. Um, so this is sort of a uh, the end talk in a series of arithmetic of, of K3 services, and it's a pretty tough act to follow the last few talks. So I'll, I'll try to do my best. Um, I, I know there's been a lot of things that uh, and gadgets that we have uh, been introduced to. I don't expect everybody to remember all of them. So I will do a little bit of, of review as, as we go along. Um, when I had to submit a title, I, I sort of sent this lofty descent on K3 surfaces uh, title. And, and I, I think that the talk will be a little more modest than what the title might promise. Um, but but, but there, there are intimations of descent in, in what I will be talking about. Um, Okay, so so before I start talking about K three surfaces, I just want to you know say a few words about curves. I expect what I'm about to say is very familiar to a lot of people in the audience, but it's just sort of a, a reminder of of you know why we're looking at K three surfaces in a sense by by sort of the analogy with with the uh, situation on curves. So if you look at, at nice curves, and by nice I mean the usual smooth projective geometrically. Uh, integral, and I'll be working mostly over number fields, but mostly really Q to simplify things. Um, the uh, when you try to classify curves, sort of the, the first thing you do in, in that sort of taxonomy of curves is, is you you put them into three buckets, basically according to their quadratic dimension, and that that basically means genus zero, genus one, and higher genus. Um, and this quadratic dimension is is sort of that the first initial branching that happens in this classification is sort of a branching that can reflect curvature on, on the curve. And so it's, it's sort of a geometric um, kind of, of um, uh, first classification into, into some buckets. And, but it has very strong implications for the arithmetic of curves. Um, again, I suspect that, that what I have in this slide is, is relatively familiar to people, but you know, I, I'll just go through it uh, uh, quickly. So if you have a, a genus zero curve, and you happen to have a, a point on it, um, then it's uh, uh, isomorphic to P1 on the nose uh, already over your ground field, and you can use stereographic projection for this. And so in those cases, we understand the points on the curve. And um, if you don't have a point, you don't have a point. So we also understand the points on the curves, which is great. So um, if your genus is one, then you have an elliptic curve, and you have this sort of really nice group structure, um, and, and the rational points form a finally generated uh, Abelian group. Um, if if the genus is is at least two, and then things get really difficult. These curves are of general type, and there's a spectacular result of all things that says that the set of rational points is finite. Um, there's been a lot of work on general type curves uh, over the last um, decade or so, and this is sort of a direction spearheaded by by Kim and pushed in, in many different directions by people like Dogra and uh, Jen Krishnan, uh, Tweetman. There's, there's many people who are uh, working on, on this sort of thing. Um, but, but when you look at, at, at this, this picture, part of what you get is, is you have this sort of like, there's this easy case, the rational curves, then this really hard case, and then there's this sort of intermediate type. And there's a lot of conjectures, and, and we have a, a reasonably good picture of what should be going on with elliptic curves, but we can't prove a lot of things. I mean, the, the bridge swinnerton dyer conjecture is probably the most salient uh, conjecture that, that is, is um, well, still open. Um, and so, so there's, there's the situation sometimes when you're trying to understand rational points and varieties where you sort of first use geometry to classify your varieties. And then there's going to be, you know, some varieties that are easier ish to understand, some that are really hard and not re really accessible to techniques that, that, that we have or only barely. And then there's sort of the varieties of intermediate type where we're still even developing a conjectural picture, but there's some hope. Of, of, of saying things something. And K3 surfaces sort of really fall into that intermediate type in, in the case of surfaces. So when you look at the Kodair dimension of a surface, that first branching that, that happens in the taxonomy, you sort of have four different uh, types. And um, you know, if you uh, 
look at, for example, this up here, rational the ruled, uh, especially rational, we, you know, we have a, a pretty sort of good conjectural picture of what's going on um, in, in surfaces that are geometrically rational, for example. Uh, general type, there are deep conjectures of, you know, Lang, Voida, this sort of thing. Um, they're very hard. Uh, and, and so K3 surfaces uh, in particular fall into sort of one of these intermediate type um, ranges in the classification where there is some hope of, of developing a, a reasonably complete conjectural picture and, and perhaps starting to, to chip away at it uh, at this point in time. And so this is, this is part of the reason we um, are looking at this uh, these days. So, so as a reminder, I mean, K3 surfaces, I, I know we've seen this definition a zillion times already, but it, 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 it's worth repeating. Um, so it's a nice surface, smooth, projective, geometrically integral. Um, it has a couple of properties. One is the irregularity is zero, and that's a proxy for telling you that it's simply connected. Um, and the canonical class is trivial, and, and that's telling you that there's a sort of uh, everywhere nowhere vanishing um, uh, holomorphic two form. Um, there's lots of examples of, of these things. Um, so we, we saw, for example, in Francesca's talk a couple of weeks ago, we were looking mostly at sort of Coomer type varieties and in particular Coomer surfaces. I'll be focusing sort of on, on slightly different uh, uh, kinds of constructions. Perhaps the simplest kind of, of K3 surfaces, I, I think, um, are the so-called degree two K3 surfaces. And, and an example of that is a, a sextic in a weighted projective space. So here I'm thinking of x, x, y, and z all having weight one and w having weight three. And this is a homogeneous equation in this weighted projective space. This space is itself singular. The ambient space is singular, but the surface misses the, the singularities of the, of the space. Um, there's degree four K3 surfaces. So uh, this is a rather famous example of, of Birchen, Swinert, and Dyer. So this is a portic in P3. Um, there's degree six K3 surfaces, which is the intersection of a, a quadric a Q and a cubic in P4, and two times three is six. That's, that's the degree of the surface. Um, and I'm thinking of a smooth complete intersection here. And then if I move up uh, and I, I, in degree and I intersect three quadrics in P5 and it's a smooth complete intersection, that's a K3 surface of degree eight. Um, and in fact, there are K3 surfaces of even degree for every even integer. But, but eventually, it's kind of hard to, to write them down like this. This is sort of like the, the these, these three sort of form the list of complete, smooth complete intersections in, in projective space that, that will do the, uh, the job. So, so these are, are sort of some of the examples that I, I want you to keep in, uh, in mind. Um, in fact, one of the first things I want to do is sort of ask a question about existence of K3 surfaces of, of arbitrary uh, degree. And so, so for that, I need to sort of introduce a little bit of, of notation. Some of these things have, have come up uh, before. So the, one of the things is that, I mean, because the canonical class is trivial on a K3 surface, there's, there's not a whole lot to hold on to, like line bundles that you can use to embed into projective space. But I am assuming that my surfaces are projective. And so, so there's, there should be some way of you know, sticking that surface into projective space. And so, so that, that means there's some ample line bundle uh, somewhere in there. And so that's the kind of data that, that we fix sometimes as our starting point. So a polarized uh, K3 surface of degree 2D is just a pair where you have a K3 surface uh, over Q. And then you take a primitive class in the geometric Picard group. This is a sort of important, but it's just a little subtlety that can be ignored for now, uh, whose square is, is 2D. And there is, a, there is a moduli space that parametrizes these, these objects. There's a coarse moduli space uh, that parametrizes uh, pairs of, of this type. Um, it is a very unwieldy thing. So it is a 19-dimensional uh, quasi-projective variety uh, over Q. So, so this is much more complicated than the J line uh, for elliptic curves. It's, it's a really sort of monstrous thing. And there's one of these for every even integer as well, um, which, is, which is sad. Um, but uh, there's, we, we do know things about the geometry, for example, of this moduli space. We know that um, this uh, coarse moduli space of polarized K3s of degree 2D is of general type for D large enough. And, and D, D large enough right now means bigger than 61. 
for this 2D. Uh, this is an awesome result in, in dimensiones of, of Ritsenko, Hulik, and uh, Sankaran in, in 2007. And it's sort of the, the equivalent in a sense of saying MG is of general type for large enough G and, and trying to give some, some bounds on that. So, so for small degrees, this M2D uh, ends up actually being rational and unirational, but eventually it becomes of, of general type. And that means that it probably gets hard to write down K3 surfaces uh, over a number field of, of degree 2D. And so, so this is sort of the, the challenge that I uh, want to um, uh, take. Sorry, I'm not really great with chat. Let me see, is there a conjecture for the precise values? For, um, well, could you just read the question all the way through? So the, the question is, is there a conjecture for the precise values of D for which M2D is of general type? I, I don't know of uh, such a conjecture. Um, there's, there's sort of a set of, um, I forget the number. It's, it's in a couple of, roughly a couple of dozen values of D for which we really don't know anything about the Kodari dimension. Uh, for, for a lot of small values of D, we have unirational parameterizations. Um, and then starting with some D, we know at least that it's, the Kodari dimension is, is non-negative, for example. That's, um, if, if you want to say that, then you can push that 61 down um, a fair bit. Um, but, um, but no, I, I don't know of, of someone who has sort of boldly stated a precise conjecture on, on what, the, um, what the value should be. Now, it is interesting though, that there are, there's another way of proving this, um, this theorem. So there's now a, a couple of ways of, of proving this result. And the, the two methods give exactly the same result. Um, so so it's, it's not, they can't be sort of complemented uh, with each other, and uh, it's it's kind of weird. Um, so I don't know if you would take that as evidence for for what the list ought to be, but but it's kind of curious that there are the sort of two methods of a very different flavor that prove the result, and and they give exactly sort of the, the same result. Um, so um, going back to Edgar's uh, talk uh, a long time ago, you know, he talked a lot about Picard groups of of K three surfaces. And we saw that um, the Picard group of a K3 is um, a, a torsion-free, uh, finitely generated uh, abelian group. And its rank, since I'm working over uh, a number field, is some number between 1 and 20. That's because it, it sort of has to line the 1, 1 part of the of a Hodge structure. Um, now, if you met some random K3 surface on, on the street uh, to um, you know, use Bianca's language, um, so you would find that, in fact, um, you, you have to have at least one copy of Z because we were saying that the surface was projective, right? And so there's, there's sort of this, this nice line model, um, but, um, but that's all you would see. So, so the, rank, the rank would just be, uh, would just be one. And in fact, there's, there's a lot of work in trying to understand um, the, uh, uh, Picard, the Picard rank one situation. Um, in fact, uh, the, the result that's sort of most relevant to what I want to talk about today is, is one of Ellenberg in, in 2004, where he says, okay, let, let me fix this even number 2D, and then I can prove to you that there's some number field uh, and a polarized K3 surface uh, that has this Picard rank one. And when I talk about Picard rank, I mean sort of after I pass to some fixed algebraic closure. Um, but the, the proof, um, is, is, is sort of similar in spirit to, to some ideas that Terrasoma had uh, a few decades earlier. Um, it sort of fleshed out quite nicely in, in, in this case, but it doesn't really give you a um, sense of what this number field uh, might be. You don't really have a whole lot of control of, of, of this number field. And so one, one challenge um, is, you know, if, if I fix a 2D, is there a polarized K3 surface uh, that's um, defined over, over Q, um, whose geometric Picard rank is one and it has that degree 2D. You know, can you really write down with proof, you know, some K3 surface of, of degree 450 for me um, over Q that has Picard rank one? And I think the answer is uh, no. I sort of hope the answer is no, in the sense that if you could do this, um, that would actually, uh, um, it, it, it would create enormous tension with a conjecture uh, that I put forth some time ago on Brower groups of, of K3 surfaces, and I'll try to explain that uh, a bit later. Um, 
And so, you know, a related question that you could ask is, well, what's the largest E for which we can show there is such a thing? Okay, so um, I actually don't know the answer to this, uh, to this question, to be uh, perfectly honest with you. Um, I mean, I, I suspect it's somewhere around um, 38 maybe for 2D, uh, but I, I, I'm not, not sure. So this, this would be, uh, it'd be nice to sort of, you know, have constructions that keep pushing that, that boundary up as, as far as uh, it, it can go. Uh, and, and there's good reasons for it as well, because it, it, that may tell you something about this conjecture on Brower groups um, that I'll talk about soon. So, um, yeah. Tony, as a row gets bigger, is this supposed to be even harder to find a Q rational point, or uh, is it possible that there would be special cases that would be easier? Um, sorry, as you, you're saying, as a row gets bigger. Yeah, I mean, so the row being one is the general case, and so it would seem that you know most likely your rational points would would have that, or do you think that in fact, rational points are somehow exceptional and so they should you know, be showing up for a larger Picard rank? I think they're sort of exceptional. I would like them to be showing up in, in larger uh, Picard rank. I mean, once, once the Picard rank grows, then you have this sort of lattice and you have chances of, for example, having a polarization in the, somewhere in there of very low degree. And you might be able to use that polarization of low degree to write down a model for that K3 surface. And so, but when the Picard rank is one, that really, it, it makes your life a whole lot harder. There's, it's not easy to, you, you won't find that nice polarization that, that, that we know how to write down. So I, I saw in the chat, Y38, um, uh, it's mostly, there are descriptions of what the general member of M2D looks like up until about 38. Um, and so you sort of have some chance of, of, of writing one of these things down and, and you know, uh, proving, say, that it has Picard rank one. Um, okay. So, um, so I want to talk about some hopes and dreams uh, for K3 surfaces and, and sort of tell you a bit a story of, of what I think the, the picture, the conjectural picture is, is converging to. So I want to think of a K3 surface um, as uh, given to us by some system of, of homogeneous uh, equations in, um, uh, over Q. And then, you know, the sort of thing that, you know, pe people in the seminar may be interested in is detecting whether, you know, such an object has a rational point or not. And it'd be great if, if there was an effective procedure, I mean, some algorithm that has some a priori sort of bound on, on this, um, on running time um, that could determine whether you have a, a point or not, uh, and that the input would be the system of homogeneous uh, polynomial uh, equations. And the, um, you know, the first thing you would do, uh, presumably, in, in trying to check uh, if, if the set of rational points is not empty, is to look at, at the set of p-adic points for every p, including the infinite prime, by which I mean you look at the real points in this case. And then of course, if there are no, if, if for some reason one of these sets is empty, then you, you know, you're, you're out of luck, you're, you can't have a rational point. But we've seen in, in the series of, of lectures um, and, and uh, uh, Francesca uh, spent uh, quite a bit of, of time explaining to us that, that you can use the Brouwer group of a K3 surface um, to, uh, uh, carve out conditions on the set of local points that must be satisfied by the set of rational points. And every now and then, for example, those, those conditions are too much. And, and um, the, uh, the, the conditions you know, end, end up giving you just the empty set inside the uh, set of local points. And you can use that perhaps to show that there are no uh, rational points. And I just want to remind you that this set had a complicated definition. We will not really need that definition in this talk, but it, what it depended on was this sort of really the quotient of the Brouwer group of X um, by the uh, elements in the Brouwer group that come from the, um, uh, the ground field via the, the structure of morphism. And, and more of this uh, in, in a little bit. So, um, so this, this gadget right here gives you a potential way of saying that there are uh, no rational points on, on your K3 surface. And um, 
So one of the hopes and dreams is, is a conjecture of, of Skorobogatov that says that that might be enough. So the conjecture uh, that Skorobogatov put in, in print in 2009 um, is that if you say, let, take a K3 surface over the rational numbers, then if you can prove that, that after carving out the conditions in the set of local points that all the Brouwer group uh, tells you you must satisfy, there is something left, then there must be a rational point. Um, so that's sort of, it's, this usually goes on by, uh, you know, by the phrasing that the brown manian obstruction is the only obstruction to the Hasse principle or something like this. So, um, so that's nice. Um, if, if this conjecture were true, then what we would have to do is, is find some way of, of um, being able to uh, effectively compute this intermediate set between the set of global points of the surface and, and the set of, of local points. And amazingly enough, there are theorems in that direction. So this is, this is not a conjecture. This is a, a nice theorem of Kresch and, and Jinkle from 2011. Uh, it's a little more general. I'm sort of specializing it to the case of, of K3 surface, it says. But it says that if you take a K3 surface and it's given to you as a set of homogeneous polynomial equations, and in addition, you have uh, generators of the Picard, geometric Picard group also given to you as uh, by, by some set of equations. And if you have a bound on this quotient uh, of the Brouwer group modulo the constant algebras, uh, that, that is effective, I mean, you know, I mean a number, you know, like 90, you know, um, then you can actually uh, compute this, uh, um, the um, uh, brouwer manin set, the so-called, this is the brouwer manin set. And this is, I mean, of course, okay. So this is, when you say effectively, right, this is the sort of thing that, I don't think this result is gonna make Drew happy in the sense that, that you know, it's not, it's not going to be the kind of thing that we can yet put into a computer and, and you know, let it do trillions of operations per second and, and have it finished before, you know, the universe goes cold, basically. So, um, however, I mean, it is a finite procedure. And of course, any improvements that we can uh, uh, do on this theorem would be, would be really nice. Of course, there is this thing that I, I've made this extra assumption that I have generators for the um, a geometric Picard group. But, um, you know, uh, Edgar told us a lot in, in January about, you know, how you might try to go about computing the uh, geometric Picard group. There is a result that is along these lines that's a little abstract. It's also the kind of result that won't make Drew happy. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to pick on you, Drew. Um, but uh, it's, it's a result of Charles that says that if you have a K3 surface and, and you uh, it's given as a set of uh, homogeneous polynomial equations, then the equations for generators, uh, or some equations for generators for the geometric Picard group are effectively computable. It's, it's the kind of thing that, I mean, the algorithm eventually starts looping through points on some Hilbert schemes. And so, you know, you're really not going to um, uh, uh, do a, a whole lot. Um, I see a, uh, hey, okay. I guess Bjorn and Kiran are having a discussion. Maybe I'll let that go. Um, you can ignore us. Just let us fight okay. it out. Yeah. Uh, sounds good. Sounds good. I, I, I have a hard, very hard time with the chat sometimes. So if there's some question, you know, I, Rachel or Drew can, can also pipe up and yeah. So, so there's, um, uh, you know, this result of Charles at least says that, you know, in, in theory, right, that the piece in, um, in the crest chinkle theorem is, is something that, potentially could be uh, taken care of. And, and so in fact, you know, developing not just um, uh, effective, but actually practical algorithms uh, for computing this geometric Picard group would be awesome. And that's the kind of thing that, that, that Edgar uh, has spent a lot of, of time uh, thinking about. And, and it's a very worthwhile uh, direction in, uh, to pursue in the arithmetic of, of K3 services. We, we need a lot of, of work yet to do. Um, but there was a, another assumption when we looked at, uh, whoops, um, yeah, okay, uh, sorry, yeah, when we looked at this crash jinkle thing, um, we needed, you know, some effective bound for this, for this Brouwer group to make the, um, uh, uh, this, uh, this work, this, this was already mentioned in, in Bianca's talk, I'm, I'm sort of rehashing that, um, there, 
we do have a conjecture uh, on along those lines that, that um, would, would be nice if it would be actually be made effective. And it's sort of a, a combination of some um, of something that uh, I wrote down in 2015 um, and, and uh, another conjecture of, of Shafarevich on, on K3 surfaces. And, and what it says is that if you, if you fix the degree of a number field, then there's some constant that depends only on that degree so that the, um, the uh, quotient of the Brown group modulo the constant algebras, which we only know is finite since 2008 by a result of square root of Gata-Manzarin, is, is in fact um, bounded by this uh, constant. And this is, so it, this constant does not depend on the K3 surface and it depends on the number field only to the extent that the number field has a particular degree, but not the specific number field. And so um, what, what this is pointing to, if you sort of put this all together, I know I've sort of thrown a lot of results at you, um, is that maybe, you know, if you look at our hopes and dreams, if you combine these theorems of Kresh and Chinkel with this sort of other you know, conjectural pieces uh, on uh, Picard groups and um, Brouwer groups, then there may uh, be a, an effective procedure to determine whether a K3 surface uh, has a, a rational point or not. And again, at this point, you know, if we could put all these pieces together, this effective procedure would not really be practical. And so one direction that we definitely want to push towards is, is actually making things practical. And that involves you know, learning how to really compute the car groups, learning how to really compute Brouwer groups in terms of, of, of equations, for example. Um, so there's, there's lots, of, lots of moving pieces in the arithmetic of K3 surfaces that we don't really know how to do particularly well yet. Uh, and, and there's lots of, of room for people to, um, to work on. Any questions? Sounds great, Tony. All right, great. So, so let's talk about Brown groups. I want to focus on that piece of, of, this, of this whole conjectural picture that said these Brown groups were, were finite um, and try to understand a little bit about what's going on. Um, Bianca already uh, told us a lot about uh, this. There are some, there are more results than I can really give proper credit to in, in this talk. Um, I'll, I'll mention a, a few. Um, but apologies because I know there's a lot of people in the audience who work on this. So um, if I take an S variety, I want to remind you that the Brouwer group, there's a cohomological definition of the Brouwer group um, that generalizes the cohomological definition of the Brouwer group of a field, um, which is I just look at the etal cohomology of uh, a GM, H2, uh, and I look at the, uh, the torsion bit for it. Um, and this is a very unwieldy thing. And so one of the, the things we usually do uh, pretty early on is to chop up the Brown group into sort of three stages, um, mostly because we can, you know, one stage doesn't matter, one is easy to handle and, and the other one is really hard. Um, and so, so inside the Brown group, there's sort of two special subgroups. There are the, there's the subgroup of constant classes. Those are the ones that are coming from the structure morphism. Remember, this is, this is a cohomology group. So if you have x down to spec k and you apply h2, you're going to get a map going the other way. Um, and that's, that's what this, uh, this thing is. The, the map, this, the, the image of bur q into bur x um, is actually injected if x has local points, which is a situation you presumably want to be in. Because if x doesn't have local points, we just go home. So, so in, in sort of the situations that you're interested in, this map is actually injected. And the Brown group of q, class field theory tells us, is really gigantic. Um, so there's a very, very large piece of, of the Brouwer group of X um, that is actually pretty innocuous and irrelevant from the point of view of rational points, but it's there and it's big. Uh, and so if you want some finiteness kind of statement, you know, usually we, we have to take a quotient by, uh, by this, this group. Then we have the uh, group of algebraic classes. These are the classes that sort of die when you pass to an algebraic closure, some fixed algebraic closure. And these are sort of geometric cohomology classes. Uh, sorry, the, uh, these are not the geometric cohomology classes. They're the ones that die. Uh, the remaining ones, the ones that don't die, those are usually called the transcendental classes of, of the Brouwer group. 
So, so usually what you do if you're trying to compute the Brown group is you, you try to do it in sort of um, in, in a couple of pieces and then put the pieces together. But even that is actually really hard to do. This is really not trivial. Um, and this is something that, that we often overlook in, in these kinds of talks, which is that, that really the, the quotient that you're interested in like, contains this sort of the, the algebraic classes modulo the constant classes. Um, and then there's sort of this group that you might call the transcendental Brouwer group. Um, but this extension is actually not so easy to, to calculate, even if you, you know what the two n terms uh, look like. However, part of the reason we did this whole thing of looking at these subgroups and looking at this uh, short exact sequence is because we do have techniques that allow us to compute the two end parts of this um, uh, short exact sequence. On the left hand side, for the algebraic Brouwer group, uh, module of the constant classes, there is an isomorphism to a Galico homology group that comes from the hostile Serre spectral sequence. And what this isomorphism tells you is that if you want to understand Brouwer classes, you need to understand the Picard group, the geometric Picard group of, of X, uh, as a Gallo module. And if you do, then, then you have a handle, uh, at least in, in principle, uh, for the algebraic classes. On the other hand, this Brouwer group um, uh, of the transcendental classes will inject into the, um, uh, the, the geometric Brouwer group fixed by Galois. Um, but this map may actually have a co-kernel. Uh, and so you have to be pretty careful. And there's, there's sort of lots of um, you know, careful theorems in trying to bound the size of, of this co-kernel. There's uh, amazing work uh, that has been done by sort of um, Askur Bogatov and, and uh, uh, some of his uh, uh, students and postdocs in, in sort of uh, understanding this, this image in, in various cases. So Damian Gewirtz and uh, Martin Orr and Domenico Valloni um, uh, and, uh, have, have done some, some great recent work on, on, this kind of, on this kind of thing. So, um, Okay, so just to, just to show you that this extension can be uh, non-trivial, you know, here's an example. Uh, it's it's from 2019, but I think this is, this example is just amazing. Uh, if you take this particular um, diagonal cortex surface, uh, then the Brouwer group modulo constant algebra is actually z mod eight z, but the algebraic part is z mod four z, and the transcendental part is z mod two z. This is a non-trivial extension. Uh, in, and it's, it's really, you know, it, it sort of explains sort of why, why many people have tried and failed uh, to, to compute these, these sorts of Brouwer groups, because when you, you know, compute, for example, an, a representative of the transcendental uh, uh, group and you try to lift it, well, it should have really been an order eight element. Um, and that's, that's a hard thing. Um, so even just computing that this uh, the, that this is the uh, the extension is, is quite difficult, and and there's a paper by Gewirtz and Skorbogatov that um, introduces some really rich ideas that are uh, applicable well beyond the uh, realm of, of diagonal cortex uh, that that I think people uh, may be able to to use and leverage to um, uh, compute these uh, these extensions. Um, but okay, so, so let, let me set the, the problem of extensions aside for a moment and, and look at sort of the, the two pieces, the algebraic Brouwer group and the transcendental Brouwer group um, for a second. And this is, I, I love doing this little lemma. Um, it's, it's hard to include proofs in a, in a seminar. And so, you know, here's, if you haven't seen this before, I, this is sort of a very nifty thing and, and it can be said in a relatively short amount of time. So, so I want to show to you that, that the algebraic Brouwer groups of, a K, of K3 surfaces are uniformly bounded. Um, and that's actually not, not so bad. So, so the idea is if, if I fix the, the Picard rank of the surfaces that I will look at, uh, then there's some constant that depends only on the rank uh, so that the algebraic Brouwer group is uh, bounded by this constant. That's what the lemma says. And since the Picard rank can only go between one and 20, then there's sort of 20 constants that I have to worry about. And then I can either take the max of those constants, or you might actually be interested in looking at the primes that divide those constants, for example, to understand what kind of torsion uh, might happen. The idea of, of the proof of this is uh, reasonably simple. So what you do is first you pass 
the, this, by the way, I learned from uh, Bianca. It's, um, I, I think it's the kind of thing that has been in the lore for a very long time, um, but it doesn't get written down very often. Um, so, uh, so you pass to a finite Galois extension of, um, of Q um, so that the Picard group is split over that finite Galois extension first. And then you look at a sort of a rather uh, simple short exact sequence and, and you take the, the long exact sequence in cohomology and then you get this, this is this H, sorry, I'm pointing, I'm using my mouse to point at my computer, but you can't see that. So here's the H1. Um, this is the algebraic Brouwer group. This is Burr one mod Burr zero. And you can see that, um, well, it's isomorphic to this mass, but, but this mass is uh, size at most the order of G to the, to the row. And that's regardless of the action. I mean, there's, there could be a sort of veritable plethora of actions that, that could have gone on that could have produced all kinds of different H1s. Uh, but in the end, that doesn't happen. So, um, or they, there might be actions, but they don't, they, they don't produce groups that are too large is, is what I'm trying to, uh, to, to get at. And so, so that's really good. Um, so in order to finish, I basically, what I need to do is show you that there's finitely many Gs, finitely many Gala groups. As, as the possibility. Um, and that'll tell me that, well, you know, there's finally many possibilities for this H1. And that's not so bad because um, this, this Gala group, um, it's, it's acting on this free module and, and the Gala group G is finite. And so it's gonna have to act through a finite subgroup of GL rho Z. And if you fix rho, there's finitely many of those because it's a sort of very classical result of Minkowski that if you uh, look at m at least three and you uh, take um, the, the kernel of reduction modulo m, that kernel is, is torsion free. So, so the, the, the finite subgroups kind of survive that, that reduction, but then you land in a finite group. And so there's, there's finally many possibilities there. And so there's, um, there's finally many possibilities for G and the size of the Brouwer group was bounded above by G to the row. And there's finally many possibilities for rho. So, so that means that the Brauer, algebraic Brouwer groups of, of K3s are, are uniformly bounded. So, so the algebraic bit is really not so difficult to, uh, to deal with. However, even here, you can imagine all kinds of questions about you know, making some of this effective and explicit. And so you know, one question you might ask is, can, can we give sharp bounds for this M row? You know, not just sort of the, the crazy bound that comes out of Minkowski's uh, lemma, uh, at the end, I mean, you you could even take the GCD of of you know all of the the bounds that Minkowski's lemma gives you because it's you know uh, it's true for m greater or equal to three, but that's still not great. Um, so you can say, I mean, a couple of quick things. Um, for example, if you look at the card rank one, then the Gal action is is going to have to be trivial um, because I'm uh, I'm projective and I have this sort of ample line bundle that's. Gala isn't moving it, it's defined over the ground field. Um, and, um, and so you have a, a profinite group acting on Z uh, uh, trivially, and so that H1 is, is um, uh, trivial. Um, for M2, um, so my uh, student, Stephen Wolf, uh, who's writing up his thesis, uh, he showed that M2 is actually less than or equal to two. Um, and, and we sort of expect that in fact, M2 is equal to one, that, that when you look at K3 surfaces of Picard rank two, uh, the algebraic Brouwer group is actually uh, trivial. Uh, there is sort of, it's, it's, there's one case where it comes out to be a Zima 2 Z that, that feels like that it, it should be, there shouldn't actually be a K3 that, that has that, that action, um, but that still needs to be uh, ruled out. And, and Stephen has also sort of computed bounds for M3 and four and so on. So uh, up to about, M7, eventually what happens is we sort of run out of like a database of, of, that has, you know, the, the list of, of all finite subgroups of GLN 18Z or something like that. We, we don't have that yet. So, so it would be nice to, uh, to have those. Um, great. So the transcendental bit, the other part of that short exact sequence. This is a little harder. Um, so it, it requires sort of a, a uh, so, some, some more difficult tools, um, which I hope we, we have seen them in this, in this series. Uh, and I, I will sort of recall some of them as, as, as needed. So I'm going to start uh, with a K3 surface 
but it's going to be over the complex numbers uh, for a while. And sort of that's sort of to guarantee that whenever I say Brouwer class of order P, I'm really talking about something transcendental. Okay, so uh, it won't, you know, it's, it's the stuff that, that does survive passage to an algebraically closed field. So the, the key player here is what's called the transcendental lattice of the, the K3 surface. And, and that's the orthogonal complement for the intersection form of the uh, Picard group inside the singular cohomology group H2XZ. And an H2XZ uh, is, um, it's a rank 22 lattice, it's free, it's a Z22. But if you write down the gram matrix for it, uh, it's a 22 by 22 matrix um, where you have these sort of five block diagonal pieces corresponding to you know, three copies of the hyperbolic plane. So the matrix 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, three times, and then two copies of the negative definite version of the sort of E8 uh, gram matrix. So it's sort of a gigantic 22 by 22 matrix that tells you how to intersect things in, uh, in this H2. So the transcendental lattice is, is the orthogonal complement in that lattice structure uh, for the, the Picard group. Um, and the, the important observation is that when you look at, at the subgroups uh, of the Brown group of X uh, elements that are killed by N, uh, this is actually isomorphic to um, uh, homomorphisms like Z, uh, abelian group homomorphisms from uh, uh, the transcendental lattice uh, to Z mod NZ. And, and so um, that actually gives you a, a grip on, on you know, some of these uh, uh, transcendental uh, elements. Um, for example, if N is a prime, um, well, uh, if you have a homomorphism from uh, the transcendental lattice to uh, Z mod PZ, the order P elements are going to correspond to surjective homomorphisms of that type. And a surjective homomorphism from uh, this transcendental lattice to Z mod PZ is almost the data of the kernel, this lattice of index P. You would also need a generator and you need to sort of know, mark a generator in the Z mod PZ. But, but if you only keep track of the kernel of the map, which is gonna be a sub lattice of index P, well, you can at least still talk about the element of the subgroup of the Brown group of, um, that this element of order P generates. And so, so if, if you wanna understand subgroups of order P inside the Brown group, what you really should try to understand are sub lattices of index P in the transcendental lattice of your K3 surface. Now this is, this is really a lattice theoretic uh, problem. So, so just so you see sort of the, the kind of results that you can get to um, from this, this is sort of an oldish result. Um, I think we finished the paper at the end of 2014 that was published in 2017. Um, so we, we looked at the case, uh, this is with Kelly McKinney and Justin Sawan and Shotanimoto. We looked at the case of a, a K3 surface that has Picard rank one. And so it has this polarization of degree 2D and then some prime that does not divide the uh, order of the polarization. In particular, it's odd. Um, and then we look uh, at the uh, transcendental lattice corresponding to subgroups generated by some element of order P in the uh, Brouwer group. And what we did was we just classified the lattices of index P. And you, you use a, a theorem of Nikulin that basically says that um, uh, this, uh, uh, the isomorphism type is essentially going to be determined by knowing things like the rank uh, of the lattice, the signature, and the quadratic discriminant uh, form. Uh, so this is the this is the quadratic form on the discriminant group. This, that's what this this little uh, Q is. Um, so, oh, okay, yeah, no, it's Kelly McKinney. It's not David McKinnon. Uh, so I just saw that. Uh, yes. Um, Okay, so, um, so what, what this table is telling us is that basically there are three isomorphism types uh, in the setting that, that we just uh, looked at. And they are distinguished um, almost by the discriminant group, which is the, um, the, the quotient of the, the dual lattice by the original lattice. This thing has ordered the, the discriminant of the lattice in fact. Um, but there, there's sort of one case where the discriminant group is cyclic in both cases, but you can distinguish them by looking at, at the uh, value mod P that this, um, uh, the discriminant quadratic form takes. And not only can you tell that there's three isomorphism classes, but then you can tell sort of within each isomorphism class, how many lattices do you see? 
Okay? And, and so this is the, the kind of result that, that we got. And if you want to sort of take, the, this is a theorem entirely about lattices. Um, uh, and if you, if you want to sort of transpose this back to some kind of uh, geometric setting, then, then here's sort of the mental picture. And then I'll explain to you why this mental picture is, is a little funny. Um, so the, the mental picture will tell you that if, if you look at M2D, and I have the same hypotheses that I had before, P does not divide 2D, then what it's suggesting, the fact that there are three isomorphism classes, it's what it's trying to tell us is that if there were some kind of moduli space uh, that parametrized polarized K3 surfaces of degree 2D together with a subgroup of order P of, of the Brouwer group, then this moduli space should probably have three components. Um, and and this, uh, this would just be the forget map that takes X comma the pair to just X. So this is sort of like the analog of a modular curve in a sense. Uh, and then these, these, the number of lattices in the isomorphism class should be telling you sort of the, the degree of, of the, the map on each one of these components. So, so if I take one of these x's, I would expect to see uh, roughly uh, 1 half p to the 10 or 1 half p to the 20, uh, many uh, points in the fiber up here for this one particular x. So um, yeah, so, so this is actually something that I, you have, if you've seen me ever give a talk about K3 surface, I, I've drawn this picture uh, a zillion times. Um, what I will say is that you can use this picture to actually try to attempt sort of uh, to construct K3 surfaces together with um, uh, specific elements of the Brouwer group um, by trying to understand rational points on these blue blobs. And, and so this is, this is what all of these dots represent. These are sort of four distinct papers that we're looking at the construction of a K3 surface with a Brouwer class of a particular type. In all cases, we are really looking at degree two K3 surfaces. So these double covers of P2 ramified along a plane sextic or a sextic surface in the weighted productive space P1112. And so, um, you know, this is uh, uh, MSTDA is, is McKinney, Sawan, Tanimoto, and, and myself. The, the H is, is Brendan Hassett. The, the V is my brother, uh, who is an extremely good uh, programmer and helped us a lot at the beginning. Um, and B is uh, Jan Berg, who is, who is in the audience as well. And this is sort of a, a, a recent paper that, that was actually, I, of these four papers, this is by far the hardest thing that, 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 we, um, that, that we did. And so um, this, part of what I'm trying to tell you is that this story about lattices has had sort of implications uh, in, in trying to understand how to construct uh, elements of, of the Brouwer group. Uh, not just sort of trying to, to bound, uh, say, um, Brouwer elements. But sadly, I, I put these quotes around uh, Y2DP, and uh, it's sort of time to, to face the music. Um, there really isn't this Y2, why not, of 2D comma P. And, and so this is something that uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about. I know that in the previous slide I had a why not, because I was trying to parametrize the level structure of a subgroup of order P, but, but let me sort of pivot a little bit to a similar case where what I really want to uh, parametrize now is not the subgroup of order P, but the actual element of order P, okay? Kind of like in, in with modular curves, you have X naught and X one, and one parametrizes like the subgroup uh, generated by a point and the other one is the point. And so, um, so this thing sadly uh, does not exist. So let me try to explain a little bit why. This is something I learned from uh, Emma Braquet, uh, who was a student of Daniel Hoibrecht and is now a postdoc in Amsterdam. So the, when you try to define this coarse moduli space, M2D, the first thing you want to do is, is write you know, the moduli functor for the moduli space of, of K3 surfaces um, over, over Q. And so what, what you want to do is you want to take your test scheme T and look at some smooth proper family of schemes over T. And this L, okay, this looks very scary, but it's not. Um, it's just like a, a, a relative version of a polarization. So remember that if you kind of look locally, this H naught of R1 should really look like H1 on X of GM, which is the Picard group. So, so this L is really sort of trying to pick for you 
sort of the, the polarization as you sort of move along the fibers in a kind of coherent uh, way. And you have to do, you, you have to pick these things up to a particular kind of isomorphism. I don't want to sort of spend uh, too much time. But what is important though, is that when you look at uh, geometric points of, of T and you pull back, then, then the fibers that you're looking at do look like a pair um, that gives you a polarized K3 surface uh, whose um, polarization uh, has a degree 2D. So that's sort of, you know, if you wanted to write down the modular space of degree 2D K3 surfaces, this is what you would write down. Unfortunately, um, this functor isn't representable, but it does have a, a coarse moduli map. Again, this, there's sort of many ways of, of, of getting to this. This is not the functor that we want, but I need this functor to explain why this Y1 does not uh, exist. What we want, our ideal functor, is a functor that would parametrize the data that we just saw. So a smooth, proper family um, uh, with base T. Then we would have this relative version of our polarization. And then I would have a relative version of my Brouwer uh, class. And so again, sort of if I zoom in locally, I, I, I just, you know, what you do, the mental picture I want you to have is that this H0 of R2 should kind of look like, well, H2 on X of GM. And so that, that's like a Brouwer class on that fiber. And so this is sort of a, a nice compatible system of, of, uh, of Brouwer classes. And so, so this is what, what we wish the functor were in a sense. Um, and so, uh, well, what, what Emma Braquet uh, showed was that, well, if, if this functor had a coarse moduli map, um, then you could use the, the sort of universal property that comes along with the coarse moduli map to show that there would have to exist a map from the putative coarse moduli map to the coarse moduli space of degree 2D K3 surfaces, namely a kind of forget uh, map. But um, if you look at, okay, so this is just a little technicality. You have, if you look at the open subset, uh, of M2D where the automorphisms are trivial, I'm sort of uh, avoiding uh, some pathologies. Um, and if you look at, at some point in uh, uh, Y1, uh, 2D and you map plop it down to, uh, to M2D, but only, I'm, I'm, I want this point to land in U is, is really what I'm trying to tell you. If you study what the fiber of this map would, would look like, um, well, the problem is that it's, it's going to look like the uh, P torsion of, of the Brouwer group, which is actually Z mod PZ to the 22 minus rho X. And that's a problem because as, uh, as you move around the fiber, that means that this, the, the Picard ring can jump in, in M2D. And then this, um, uh, this, this Brouwer group will also start jumping. And what, um, the, this is gonna be the locus where this, this map uh, is gonna be ramified, but the, the locus where the Picard rank jumps is not as risky closed locus. It's 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 a, I mean it's it's a mess. It's an uncountable union of the risky closed uh, subsets, and so that can't be the ramification locus of, of some map like this. And so this this Y one just isn't there for you. Uh, it, it 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 can't be there, um, which is really kind of sad times. So what that is telling you is that you're looking at the wrong thing. You're you're um, you're, you're too eager to parameterize this Brouwer class. You should have been doing something else. And this is sort of what's, uh, this is in, in Emma Braquet's PhD thesis in, in 2020, which is it's an incredible uh, piece of work where, you know, she says that what, what you should have been looking at, you know, at, at, at sort of at the level of a point, you should have been parameterizing a triple and the triple should have consisted of a K3 surface of degree 2D and this class alpha shouldn't have really been a Brouwer class, but it should have been something that is close-ish to a Brouwer class, um, uh, namely um, something in um, uh, the uh, homomorphisms from a primitive cohomology uh, to Z mod RZ. And the primitive cohomology just means the orthogonal complement of the, uh, of the polarization. I should note that when rho is one, the orthogonal complement of the polarization is the transcendental lattice. And so you would, this alpha would be picking for you a Brouwer class, but, but this is sort of part of the fix. It's trying to address the problem that when the Picard rank jumps, the transcendental lattice no longer coincides with the primitive cohomology. And it's the primitive cohomology that we really should have been uh, looking at. And so 
it's it's kind of a a, a messy thing to uh, to do, but you have to relativize this choice of a, a, a primitive um, a homomorphism from the primitive cohomology to z mod r z, and this is what this this r two is really doing for you. So um, so now you have to the, the correct moduli functor that you have to take is the usual thing of you know some smooth proper family. You have your polarization, and now you have a um, uh, a particular class that that rises in, in that's really sort of looking at, at homomorphisms from a primitive cohomology to z mod r z, and that's sort of the, the right thing to uh, to look at. And when you do that, it does fix the problem. So so Emma uh, showed that there in fact there is a a coarse moduli space of the of the type that that you would like. And in fact, she bounded the number of components uh, on this moduli space by uh, r. So R used to be P. P was prime, but but Emma doesn't require prime. So so for her, it's it's really sort of a, a positive integer, um, and um, but this bound, however, is is not really sharp. If you actually take sort of one of the first cases, the bound will tell you that this modulus space has at most four components, but really two of them actually get identified, and so um, so so there's there's more work to um, to be done here. So in, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to sort of take one step back and be like, wait, where, where are we and, and what's what's next? So we're really deep in the woods at this point on, on this trying to understand moduli spaces with level structures coming from the Brouwer group. Um, and what we really would like to do eventually is to try to understand rational points on those moduli spaces, um, because we're hoping that mod rational points on those moduli spaces will tell us something about the, the possible orders of elements of the Brown group on, on a K3 surface. So, but however, I mean, we're, we're still, there's, there's a lot to be done at the level of moduli spaces. So one thing, immediate thing, and if you're interested in this, you should really contact Braquet um, because she may well be working on this because it's a natural question to ask. So, you know, do a, a lattice polarized version of the spaces that she was looking at. Instead of just fixing one line bundle, fix a sub lattice uh, of, of the K3 lattice, you're going to start producing spaces that are sort of smaller dimensional. Um, uh, you could ask, you know, um, for which, which of these spaces are of general type, for example. Uh, so what, what kind of polarizations would give you a, a general type space? Um, it'd be really nice to have an exact formula for the number of components of, of these spaces. Um, and, in the event that you're looking at K3 surfaces of Picard rank one, this does coincide with the kind of, of uh, locus that we were interested in. And so can we get some kind of geometric interpretation of this, of this locus? So the kind of thing I mean by that is, if I take you back to this picture, um, there, I, I told you there had been three, uh, there were three components. Um, we actually understand sort of the, the geometry of a couple of, of these components in some cases, they tend to be related to um, higher um, degree K3s. Um, they, sometimes they related to uh, special cubic fourfolds. And sometimes we have no idea. Um, so we still, the, um, we, uh, in, these, in the series of papers, um, we got lucky in this one. This was Brendan Hassan and I some time ago. That, that in this particular case, d equals one and p equals two, there was an interpretation for this moduli space off the shelf in a paper of Van Heyman. Um, but the moment you move into higher d or higher p, um, I don't really know uh, what this third moduli space really looks like. This one of these will always look like um, uh, K3s of higher degree. And so what that means is that, for example, you can take a K3 of degree eight and construct the K3 surface of degree two together with a two torsion Brouwer class. Um, and, so, and, and often you will see special cubic fourfolds appear uh, as well. But we, there's, there's much, much work to be done. So, so you know, one of the things that, that you know, is, is interesting for me at, the, at this point is, is sort of trying to understand a bit more about these, these moduli spaces. But we should also, you know, I, I hope I conveyed to you sort of several other questions along the way. You know, there's we need to be looking at, at effective and practical versions of, of computing Picard groups and Brouwer groups um, as well, if we want to sort of put all of these pieces together and into, into a coherent picture. So 
All right. Um, thank you. Hey, Tony, thanks so much for that wonderful talk. Uh, let's see, there were lots of discussion in the chat. Does anyone want to bring up any questions? I have a question that was not in the chat. Oh yeah, go for it. So when you when you were giving this proof about finite BR1 mod BR0, in the first step you uh, reduce to passing to an extension K, is it easy to see that sort of passing to a finite extensions only change the bar, that part of the bar group by a finite amount? Like how, how did you make the reduction to a finite extension? Ah. So, so really, what I was doing is, so you, you know, you, you have your your geometric Picard group is given by some equations. Those equations have a bunch of coefficients, and I'm basically sort of throwing all those coefficients into the soup, uh, joining them to Q, and then taking a Galois closure, so that that I understand the Galois module structure of the geometric Picard group, but after only a finite extension, and then I was computing the. The algebraic bar group is H1 of Galois acting on pick X bar. And what I'm saying is I just have to pass to pick X K to understand that H1. And so, so I'm not, I'm not really base changing the Brower group uh, in, in doing that. Does that make sense? I see. Thanks. Yeah, I misunderstood. Great. Right. So for this, um modified moduli space that you talk at the end of. So now they're going to be smaller than the places where the Picard rank jumps. But so can you, um, is it easy to see, I guess the ramification locus must be contained in the locus where the Picard rank jumps. Mm -hmm. So does it, is it, jumping, is it just like jumping in a particular way where the lattice enlarges in a, in a fixed way? And that's the ramification locus of the map or is that part not understood? Wait, sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question back. So, so, so I mean, the reason why you said that the course modeling space does, didn't exist first of all is because the ramification locus you were getting that it's, that it's too big because right. you were characterizing Brouwer classes and not just these um, yeah. homes. So some of these homomorphisms that you get might correspond to trivial Brouwer classes or algebraic Brouwer classes when the Picard rank jumps. Yeah. So I guess I'm asking on the fixed moduli space, uh -huh. there is potentially still some ramification is it like only over singular K3s or does it include some smooth K3s and this, can we describe which smooth K3s are in the ramification locus of the map? Right, so, so I, I would guess that, that we fixed the problem over the smooth K3s because we're sort of, now we're carrying a lot more data. And, and so when the Picard rank jumps, somehow that, that means that that part of this polarization data that you fix, you know, that extra direction now contributes to that, but you're sort of still keeping track of it. Um, and so you don't, you, you no longer see that, like that, that, that jump that you were seeing before. So it's, it's sort of narrow severity and Brouwer sort of sandwich that H2. And so, you know, whenever Brouwer goes down, narrow severity goes up, but that H2 that we're sort of looking at is so sturdy. Um, and so um, I, I think that you no, no longer have ramification there. Um, the singular points, I would still expect something, but um, I don't know if that really answers your question. Thanks. Great, let's see, any other questions? Can you say something about the the proof ideas for showing that large degree K three services have general type? Are either 
there were two you mentioned, and I'm wondering, are they different from this, like MG having general type where you look at boundary divisors? In the right. So, so I think what, so what you do is you, you want to look at, you know, some um, period domain uh, for these, these K3s and sort of interpret at least, you know, some gigantic open subset of this K2D as, you know, some local period domain modded out by some action of a group. And then you want to produce lots of pluricanonical forms on this thing, which, so what you want to start with is, is sort of a, a nice supply of kind of modular forms for that group. Um, and so there is a, uh, <laughs> there's sort of one trick that we know how to use, which is that the Borchers produced this, this magical uh, particular modular form um, for uh, a modular group acting on some lattice that is sort of some kind of superset of the, uh, of the K3 lattice. And so you can sort of take that, that form and start restricting and moving it around. And then you have to be really careful because when you restrict the modular form to some like really high co-dimensional thing, you, it might be zero, for example. So, um, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's the sort of thing. It's, it's sort of looking at, at there's, there's this magical modular form of, of Borchardt's and then using that magical modular form to produce pluricanonical forms for, for that group uh, to show that that period domain mod that gamma is, is general type. And both of, the, both of the proofs were using this modular form approach? Um, I think so. the The second proof, what it tries to do is is to try to un, tries to understand the the Picard group for the for this moduli space, or at least the rational Picard group for this moduli space, and and it uses sort of this um, am amazing theorem that it's it's rationally generated by another Lefschetz divisors. Um, and I, I'm forgetting how the rest of the proof goes right now, but I, I it had a very different flavor to me. I, I don't, I don't remember sort of seeing that Borchardt's form really pop up in there. So it is sort of really using the, the structure of, of the Picard group. That's probably closer to like the MG proof, right? So, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So let me just make an announcement that we'll, uh, we will return on April 6th to talk about Manin conjectures and rational points. And the first speaker is Jordan Ellenberg. Uh, but there are still a few more very interesting questions in the, in the window here. Um, Isabella, do you wanna ask your question? Okay, I typed it, but I can ask it. Uh, I was just wondering if you could spell out you said the tension between your conjecture and existence of geometric Picard rank one K3s that are defined over Q. Right. Um, thanks. Yeah, no, that's, thank you for the question. So yeah, it's, it's sort of coming from this picture again. It's the fact that um, one of these, these sort of components that you look at um, will always correspond to um, a, a moduli space of K3 surfaces. So it'll look like M2, M2DP squared is what I'm trying to get at. So if, if you're looking at, at elements of order P and the subgroups that they generate, um, then you know the, the, one of these components will always look like M2D P squared. So if you could find some rational point in, in you know, sort of arbitrarily high polarizations, for example, one of these 2D P squared, then you would probably be able to use that surface to construct a K3 surface of degree two together with some element of order P in the Bauer group of that K3 surface. And that element of order P, that P could be as large as you like, as long as you can construct that, that surface with this huge degree polarization. And so that would sort of suggest that it's not possible to uniformly bound the, um, the Brouwer group of, of the K3 surface, because I can keep producing order P elements for arbitrarily large primes P. Does that? Make sense? Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thanks.
Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming today. I'm looking forward to seeing you in two weeks. Yeah. Sorry, if I could ask one more question. Oh um, yeah, definitely go for it. Yeah, um, what do we know about, <clears throat> about the Kodaira dimension of, let's say, um, moduli spaces of K3 surfaces with Picard number two? Right. Um, there was a recent paper um, that looked at uh, the Kodaira dimension of moduli spaces of elliptic K3s. So it's sort of not, not quite exactly what you're asking for, but, but definitely relevant in the sense that to have an elliptic vibration, your Picard rank has to be at least two. And so it was looking at, at moduli spaces of K3s that contain sort of uh, something like the lattice zero, one, one, zero in the, in the polarization uh, data. And, um, and then looking at divisors inside that moduli space. So asking for some third direction where, um, uh, where, where there was a polarization whose degree was actually growing. Uh, and then looking at, at those moduli spaces. And, and they also prove that, that it's a, these spaces are of general type. I'm blanking on who the authors are right now, but they definitely reference the um, paper by Gritsenko, Hulik, and Sankaran. So, so it should, one should be able to trace back at least by looking at the references to that paper. So, but, but yes, uh, you know, it's the, the kind of thing that you, I mean, I would expect that if you fix some kind of polarization and you have some kind of um, discrete invariant, uh, the, or like a lattice polarization, and there's some, you know, like the discriminant, maybe something a little extra has to keep growing, um, then, then these things ought to become of general type um, reasonably quickly. Yeah, I, I agree. That's my expectation too. Yeah, thanks. Let's see, any more questions? I'll ask a quick one based off of um, Isabel's comment as well. So your expectation about your, uh, why, you know, you don't want to have, you, 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 you don't expect, you know, general K3 services of, of card number one of high degree. Um, and that uh, that's, that would be equivalent to not having, you know, some associated K3 with some Broward class that, that would, you'd also not expect one of those is, 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 um, is that derived equivalence between like the K3 and the associated K3 with, with Brower class, is that is that known to be true over the rational numbers? I, I think so. Okay, th that was basically, okay. Cool. I, I, mean, I think this goes back to Mukai, um, yeah. who was not working over the rational numbers, but, right. but, but I, I, I think it has- Everything is algebraic enough that it'll, 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 just, it'll just work over the, okay, that's, that's awesome. So yeah, so then that's, that's definitely- yeah. Cool. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm, I, I really hope we can uh, keep going with these great comments for all the future talks too. So Tony, I wanna thank you again. Thank everyone for coming and see you in two weeks.